my trip to uh, Uppsala has taken a long time. Actually, it started 56 years ago. In 1959, I came to Europe for the first time. I was at that time a high school student and I went on an exchange program to Switzerland where I lived with a family. I still remember going home uh, on the boat since in those days uh, you still traveled by boat uh, across the ocean. Uh, I had the understanding that uh, if I wanted to be really rich, I should uh, become a teacher. <laughs> Why? Because if you work for money or you work for material and you give it away, you have less for yourself. But if you work for information and you give it away, you still have it for yourself. So it seems uh, trite and silly, but I decided then to become a professor. And almost immediately after uh, getting back to the United States, I had the opportunity to start teaching because in those days it was the practice for exchange students to talk about their programs. And I gave, I don't know, 30 or 50 speeches uh, in the following year to different groups. And ever since then I've been a teacher. I went. Uh, and got a degree in chemistry. Then I went on and got a doctorate and became a professor at MIT. And then I went to other places and did other things. And uh, finally, about 10 years ago, I retired. But I still uh, am very active teaching and writing, speaking, and traveling. Uh, I'm going to be talking about teaching today. Some of you probably came thinking I'm going to talk about limits to growth. No. This afternoon uh, there will be an opportunity to talk about some aspects of limits to growth, but uh, that's not my main focus. Uh, later this morning if we have time and you have questions or, or during the coffee break I would be happy to talk about these things. But for this group, in the formal session, the focus is on teaching. And my goal is to give you things, tools, that you can use to make your own teaching more effective. That's my objective. And I'm going to focus on educational games. I'm going to do a bunch of games today, actually 11. And I will describe three others. And I'll give you a lot of slides, show you a lot of slides. Don't take time to write down anything from the slides because I gave the slides to the BUP organizers. And if anything is interesting in what I say, then you can just get the slides uh, directly. They're in PowerPoint. Most of you can use PowerPoint. Um, and you're free to use them however you like. Most of the games I will be describing are in uh, two books that I've written. Uh, one is, I think, used here to some extent, Systems Thinking Playbook. And there's a new uh, book coming out, which uh, is uh, a collection of simple games, uh, mainly related to climate change. So uh, some of the games are described in my slides. Others are described uh, in the books. I am always embarrassed when I speak in Europe that I have to speak in English uh, and force everyone else to deal in my language. However, here I have, of course, the excuse that there is no other common language. Uh, it means, however, that uh, we need to be careful about understanding. I will do my best to speak loudly and slowly and with a fairly uh, simple vocabulary. Uh, nonetheless, uh, 
I'm not going to make myself perfectly clear. And if I say something you don't understand, please raise your hand and ask. If you don't understand, you can be sure that at least 10 or 15 other people in the audience also don't understand. So you're doing them a favor by being the one who is embarrassed to say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. I have always used simple games in my teaching. Originally, they were a very, very minor part of what I did. Uh, my courses attract students from many different disciplines. I have myself been a professor of engineering at one university, I was a professor of business at another university, and I was a professor of social sciences in another university. So I have a very um, varied group of colleagues and students. And that poses a problem for teaching because the best teaching uses examples to illustrate. And if you have biologists and philosophers and chemists and religious majors in your student group, it's difficult to find one example that can be understood by everyone. So from the very beginning, I typically would start my class with a very simple game about something. And then that game became the basis of shared understanding. And I could make references to the game, which I could imagine everybody in the class would understand. So that was the main reason that I used games already uh, in the 60s when I first started teaching at MIT. Then in 1982, uh, by that time I was already a professor at a different school and the chairman of a department which was producing many students. In 1982, uh, the day of my 40th birthday, by accident, I was in Washington, D.C., the capital of the United States. And in those days, most of my students, after they graduated from my program, they went down to Washington, D.C. to work in the Congress or for the President's White House or in uh, one of the administrative agencies. And so, because I was anyway in Washington, I organized a birthday party for me. And I invited all my former students. I think I had 40 or 50 students there. And uh, during, we had a lovely evening. During the course of that evening, I went to each student separately and said, well, now you are out of the university, you are working. What do you remember about our program. What do you do? Remember anything that I taught you? Uh, and almost all of them remembered some game. They didn't remember my lectures. They didn't remember my reading assignments. They didn't remember my tests. But they remembered uh, the games. And uh, and, and in a useful way, uh, they had taken some important lessons from the game. So I said to myself, okay, if that's what students remember, then I'm going to start using more games. And I uh, left my uh, job for a year and taught myself how to build and how to use educational games. And since then, they have become a very important uh, part of my teaching. So now I'm going to try and share with you some of the ideas and some of the tools that I have gotten uh, in the years, 30 years now, uh, since my 40th birthday party. Theory and practice of educational games. First of all, we need to point out that there are many ways of teaching and learning. 
Uh, so, of course, lectures. That's what we like, lectures, because you put your lecture in your desk, and then when the day comes, you pull it out, and you go stand in front of all your students, and you don't have to spend very much time just reading down through your lectures. Reading assignments. Uh, stories. Before there was writing, stories were the way that learning was conveyed from one generation to the next. Now, you see, you're taking pictures of these slides. And, I mean, it's OK. But I told you, you can have the slides. Yeah, I see. Uh, you know, in the old days, when there were no books, then there was in each group a storyteller. And that storyteller was specialized in stories which captured the essential features of religion, culture, ethics. And the young people would be informed by these stories. And even still today, stories are an extremely powerful way of teaching. If you are skilled, because you can help the student get in contact with their own experience in the context of the story. Uh, group, uh, group work, where you put a group of students together and give them some assignment, and they start to help each other to learn. Games, uh, which will be the focus of our discussion this morning. Movies, uh, and now videos on, uh, on laptops have become important. Uh, many movies are just entertainment, but some are extremely informative. We say that a picture has the value of a thousand words. Movies are pictures. Of course, I think a game has the power of a thousand pictures. <laughs> computer simulations are a new way where you create a world on the computer and you interact with it. It's my specialty, uh, but not uh, the focus of our work today. Internships where the students go off uh, in one way or another to observe and work with a master and acquire the insights. And a technique that I have used also in some of my own programs, filming, where the student uh, does something, for example, gives a speech, and I make a film of the student giving the speech. And then afterwards, we sit down and we watch the film and discuss it. And it lets the student become a critic of their own behavior. Very powerful, can be a very powerful way of, uh, of uh, education. None of these is good by itself. Just like you don't make a soup out of one thing, typically. Not a good soup, anyway. Uh, so as teachers, we want to find the best way of combining these so that they reinforce each other. Many of you know more about some of these things than I do, but I'm just going to focus today on games. But because I'm speaking only about games, you shouldn't imagine that I think games are the only way to teach. There was a movement in the United States back around 1910, 1920, amongst uh, grade school gymnasium uh, teachers to try and build all lessons into games. And there was an enormous literature. I have uh, dozens of books from that time. It didn't work, and I don't think it can work. Uh, games are important, but there needs to be other ways of bringing in information. I'm going to, uh, now we come to the piece of paper. Okay. I'm going to give you a simple illustration of why games are very important. So please take this piece of paper, which was on your chair. Now, this is very important. Do exactly what I say. Don't ask any questions. Just do what I say. And. My goal is to produce 
that we all have exactly the same shape of paper. So here's how to do it. Fold your paper in half. Does anybody not have a piece of paper? Ra raise your hand. M Maria has lots of paper. Okay. So, good. Tear off the upper right hand corner. Perfect. Fold your paper in half. Tear off upper left hand corner. Oh, what an excellent group. <laughs> Fold your paper in half one more time. And tear off the lower right hand corner. Perfect. So I told you what to do. You exactly followed my directions. And so now we should all have the same piece of paper. No. <laughs> this is very disappointing. <laughs> I used extremely simple words, and I was very careful to tell you what to do, and you tried exactly to follow my directions, and practically everyone is different. Now imagine what happens when you stand up and try to tell your students a picture about sustainable development. Can you imagine what kinds of different understandings and pictures and images are left in their mind? Nothing like the one that's in your mind. You see, and this is our problem as teachers. So now let's just, why did this happen? How did it happen? You are smart, eager people. You tried to do exactly the right thing, and it didn't work. Why not? Because you can turn the paper all the way around. Well, so first, one thing, the vocabulary can have many different meanings. Uh, when I say fold in half, it could be like that. It could be like that actually could be like that. Mm -hmm. So the, the vocabulary is quite ambiguous. It can have many different meanings. And then you have the problem. My upper right is your upper left. Mm -hmm. Another problem. Why else did it not work? You didn't ask questions. I didn't permit you to ask questions. So of course, as soon as you have any uncertainty, you start moving off in, a, in the wrong direction because you are not able to get back in connection. Any other reasons? I didn't show you what we were trying to do. If I had held this up ahead of time, then you would have had some basis for knowing if you were moving in the right direction or not. Okay. Well, all of these problems happen when you lecture. It's impossible for students to ask questions, enough questions to be certain. When you lecture, typically, you, you have no way to tell the students where they're going to end up. Uh, and so we need to find some way to supplement lectures as a way of achieving our teaching goals. This incident is called paper tear. And it's one of the little exercises uh, in the book. I use this often when I'm working with students to encourage them to ask questions. Uh, and if you have time, one thing about these games, you can do these games in a couple minutes, or you could spend an hour. You can make this into a, an hour-long game about communication practice. And for example, an interesting uh, addition is to, to 
tell the students, okay, now you do it. But you need to try and do it in a way which causes everybody in the class to have the same shape. Uh, and then they get into a discussion. How can the student stand up front telling what to do in a way that will let everybody follow along? It becomes a very useful practice. Okay. This illustrates an important principle. When I hear, I forget. When I see, I remember. When I do, I understand. Games are learning by doing. So here's what I'm going to do this morning. Uh, I'm going to give you some important concepts and vocabulary related to educational games. Uh, I make a few comments about sustainable development. Not many. It's not my main purpose. Uh, and I'm going to show you a couple different versions of one sustainable development game that I use a lot, fish banks. And then finally, at the end of the morning, I will uh, talk about climate change and show you a set of simple games that can be used to illustrate some important aspects of climate change. Games are structured role-playing exercises. A game is a procedure where participants, one or more participants, are given a goal and rules for how to achieve the goal and some indicators of success. It means not only like football, but also like paper tear. They are both games. Games have several different parts or components. Simple games will miss some of these. Complex games will have all of them. But when you're going to use a game in your own teaching, it's useful just to go down the checklist and, and ask yourself, do I need anything of this list? So there's the scenario. The scenario is the story about what happened before, where this is happening, uh, and the general circumstances. You know, in the case of paper tear, we don't need a scenario. I mean, it's, it's just us. But for a more elaborate game, uh, let's say about fishing, then I would have to say, who are you? you know, what are generally the circumstances, the history, and so forth? That's the scenario. There are rules. There have to be permitted behavior and decision possibilities, both for the players and for the referee. Sometimes the logic of the game is built into the game procedures. Sometimes you need an outside referee who watches and says, sorry, you can't do that, or you, you can do that. Sometimes in the game, there will be different roles. In this paper tear game, you all, this, all had the same role. Uh, but in, for example, in soccer or football, there are different roles, of course, goalkeeper, striker, so forth. Uh, and the game has to describe the role. There have to be goals. How do you know who wins? Uh, it's unfortunately an aspect of our culture, global culture, that people become more enthusiastic and more energetic if they think they can win something. So uh, we tap into that energy with, with goals. Uh, I give you an example. I, one time I was a professor at a Dartmouth College in the United States and the HIV epidemic was uh, becoming quite powerful and the college officials asked me to develop a lecture about HIV so the, to tell the students acceptable and unacceptable behavior. You can imagine how enthusiastic the students were to come and sit in a lecture and listen to me tell them 
about sex. I mean, they uh, it was really not a very interesting uh, thing. Even if they came, I knew they weren't uh, paying any attention. So I created a game about HIV uh, on a college campus, and I said to the students, you're going to play the game, and in order to win, you need certain information. And then I gave them the lecture. And then they were very enthusiastic to listen to the lecture because it would help them to win the game. There need to be indicators, uh, how are you doing, feedback uh, during the game. Steps of play, uh, what logically are the things to do. Often there will be cycles, that you go through the same steps of play several times. The materials of the game and then the general surrounding. Uh, for example, I developed uh, a game for the Italian Ministry of Health to train African doctors. And I got a bunch of posters from the World Health Organization. I put the posters on the wall. They didn't have any role in the game, but they created an atmosphere uh, for, the, for the gameplay. So these are the parts of the game. Games uh, can be used at different levels. <laughs> Manual games are simple games where the procedure or the logic is with physical materials. Stories, uh, they can teach stories or behavior patterns. Uh, sometimes simple feedback loops can be taught in this way. And archetypes uh, are uh, sort of pure examples of different behavior, addiction, uh, es uh, uh, escalation of conflict. These are archetypes. Addiction appears in many different places, and games can be used to teach about the principles of that. To become more complicated than that, you need, I go over to computer games, where the rules or some of the procedures are built into the computer code. And this can be used to teach uh, more complex models, adaptive policies, how to adjust or prepare for something, how to implement strategy. At the most fundamental level, we're talking about paradigms. This is mental frameworks, culture, norms, ethics, and values. Generally speaking, you aren't able to convey these with manual games. But uh, occasionally, if you create a complex role-playing game, uh, it can be used to, to convey some of these things. We're going to be talking up here today, by and large. Games have many different purposes. Uh, there is a class of games called mixers. When a group comes together for the first time and they don't know each other, it can be useful to play some sort of a game which gives them an opportunity to meet each other, uh, to start to develop some trust, uh, to release physical energy. When I'm running a three or four day workshop, typically I start with a game because when people come in from every different place, you know they are sitting there thinking about all sorts of different things and not paying attention to you. And so a game can be a way to sort of get them focused. Uh, games can be used to provide a shared vocabulary and a shared metaphor. This is the kind of game I was using in the old days. Remember when I told you that my students remembered a game? It was a game that I had played with them to give them a shared vocabulary. Uh, they can be used to illustrate some important points about structure. I'll do that uh, later this morning with my climate change games. Uh, to explain the past behaviors of a system, often you are interested in uh, let's say, uh, rising crime rate or uh, growing CO2 levels in the atmosphere, something like that. So that's a past behavior, and games can be helpful to illustrate that. If you have a more literal or precise game, you can actually start to use it for testing the effects of alternative policies. Uh, and 
probably not for social systems, but for physical systems, conceivably even to predict the future behavior of a system. Uh, just to illustrate uh, what I mean here, I have a friend who uh, used to do consulting for large corporations, and he would build a game specifically for a company. For example, there was a large uh, pharmaceutical company which needed to put a laboratory, a research laboratory, in some European nation. Uh, this was before the time of the European Union, and each nation had different laws, different educational systems, different levels of uh, personnel, different salary levels, different taxes, different laws about the use of animals in testing. Very, very complex uh, situation. And so he built a game, and all the senior executives of the company came together for a weekend. They played the game, and in the game, they figured out where was the best place to put their laboratory, and then they went home and they actually built a multi-multi-million dollar laboratory in that country. Uh, the thing about these games is they're very expensive to build, they're very precise for one organization, typically you only play them one time, and that organization doesn't want anybody else to see the game, of course, because it has a lot of secret uh, information in it. So I don't, uh, by and large, I don't uh, do this kind of gaming. I'm, I'm working up, up here. Games can also be recreational, uh, soccer or video games, uh, for example. That's an important class of games. Uh, I don't use them. I'm, uh, I'm more interested in social games, which involve uh, interaction and which teach you something about uh, real life. I find it useful to talk about different types of games depending on the number of people that you're working with. By and large, today, we must work with what I call mass games. Mass games are like paper tear. I stand up in front and tell you what to do, and each of you can play the game, but you don't interact with each other. Basically, you're interacting with me. However, it can be very useful educationally because you have an experience of the game, and then afterwards, all of you had the same experience, so we can talk about it and try to bring the lessons out of it. That's a mass game. Demonstration games, you'll see some of those this morning, where a small number of people, three, five, eight, come up front, they do a game, and everyone else watches. And then we talk about it and try to draw the lessons out of the game from, by, by, from the demonstration. Participation games are where you have a group small enough that everybody can play the game. Generally speaking, I don't like demonstration games too much. Uh, often people will say to me, I want to watch. And I don't like for them to watch. Uh, their experience is different. Often the people who want to watch are of a higher rank than the ones who are playing. And then the ones who are playing start to be very <coughs> embarrassed or very careful that they shouldn't make mistakes. Uh, because of the people who are watching, it it's, uh, it's sets up a bad dynamic. And so, by and large, I don't, uh, I don't like demonstration games. Uh, at one time in my life, I was uh, the manager of a 40 hectares game center. It was a team building center. Uh, 10,000 people a year would come to this center to do things, to games of different sorts for a day. Uh, and their purpose was to learn how to work together better as a team. And often at that team building center, someone would say, I want to watch. And we never would permit that. It uh, wasn't acceptable. Okay. When you run a game, I'm sorry, I'm going to start doing games pretty soon, but I just have a little bit of theory to get through first here. Uh, when you run a game, you need to be aware of, of what's really happening, what's, what's going on. 
the game isn't only what happens. It's what is brought into the experience by the participants. So the expectations, their experience, their emotions, uh, their relationship to the other people in the game, these are all important in the course of the game. And you need to keep that in mind when you're choosing and then running a game. Uh, for example, trust in colleagues. Uh, most games don't involve any physical danger. Although it's amazing how people can manage to hurt themselves <laughs> even doing incredibly simple things. Nobody probably got a paper cut from this uh, first exercise, but you know, such, such things happen. You have to be aware of that. Uh, and so trust in the other colleagues is important. And if there's a power relationship, uh, for you as teachers, more likely, you know, there's, uh, let's say, boyfriends and girlfriends. I, you know, I'm not sure. But there are relationships between those people which they bring into the game, and that will influence their experience of the game. Um, uh, just as an example, when I do games in Thailand, for example, physical contact between men and women who are strangers to each other is not acceptable. In the United States, it's absolutely no no consideration at all. But if I try to do the same game in Thailand that I do in the United States, in the United States they learn from it, and in Thailand they are sitting there being concerned that they're touching a foreign person, a strange uh, person of typically of the opposite sex. I mean, it's extremely difficult. Um, I have enough moral authority that they typically will do it if I tell them to do it, but then I need to realize that they're not going to learn anything from the game. They're simply going to be sitting there being embarrassed about this. So you have to make adjustments. Uh, what I do in that particular case, typically, if depending on the numbers, I may put all the women on one side of the room and all the men on the other side and then do parallel games. Or if I have a very small number of people, uh, you can have, uh, you know, for example, you can, I can hold on to a piece of paper and then another person can hold on and that way they are connected but they aren't touching. So you, you just need to be aware of that. Uh, the frame provided by the operator is, this, is essentially the story. What, you know, wh where were you before you came into the game experience? Then there's some experience of the game itself uh, and what's extremely important the logical and I call emotional structure of the debriefing. Logical structure is clear. That's the steps that you go through in order to draw the lessons out of the game. Emotional structure may not be so clear. Some games are very intense. When you're dealing with social games, uh, if you're game with, and in sustainable development, it's inherently a social process. If you are honestly dealing with sustainable development, you are going to be getting into issues which cause people to become unhappy, excited, angry, and so forth. If the game is useful, it may recreate those emotions. And before you move into the debriefing, the lessons phase, you have to, to resolve those emotions. You know, I have a game I'll tell you about in a minute where Part of the lesson of the game is the fact that two people, just like you, can get within 30 or 40 minutes to the point where you really would like to start punching each other. That's, a, that's an important part of the game. That's an, uh, it's a key lesson. To, so you need to bring the game to the point where that happens. But then when you stop the game, you need people to quit thinking about punching somebody and start talking about what did they learn from the process. So that's what I mean by the emotional structure of, of the debriefing. The logical structure is extremely important. One of the biggest dangers of becoming an effective game user is that your students much rather play games than debrief. And what happens is in the course of your lecture, let's say you have an hour with your students, the amount of time that you spend playing a game gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, 
which means that the amount of time you have for talking about the lessons gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So you need to be clear. Almost no game is self-evident. Almost no game produces lessons by itself. You, as a teacher, you need to take the participants through a process to pull the lessons out of the game. Here's how you do that. Seven questions. First question, what happened in the game? What were the experiences in the game? With paper tear, I, you know, I, that was clear. I held up the shape and we could immediately see everybody got different shapes. We didn't need to talk about it. Often you need to talk about it. What did you experience in the game? Not only events, but also emotions. How did you feel during the game, etc. Then comes the question, do those features also exist in real life? For it to be useful as a teaching device, the game has to be somehow related to real life. Uh, if it's totally apart from real life, then I can't understand how it's going to be useful as a teaching device. So you need to help the students see where the features of the game happen also in real life, in that aspect of real life, which is interesting. Then the third question, why did the game produce those results? Remember, I asked you with paper tear, why did this happen? And then you talked. You said, well, no questions, uh, etc." So you have to see how did, uh, what was it in the game that caused that result? And then comes the question, do those characteristics also exist in real life? Of and I said, in lectures, of course, they also exist in real life. So uh, going back. Then the fifth question, how could you cho uh, change the game to get better results? You see what we're doing? We're using a fairly neutral game as an object for discussion. It does two things. First of all, you can make a mistake in a game without serious consequence. That's crucial because all of us learn from mistakes. We don't learn from successes. In real life, our culture, by and large, doesn't permit mistakes. You know, if a national leader gets up and says, I made a mistake, they get voted out. It's not acceptable. But in real life, actually, you learn from your mistakes. So we are creating a safe place to make mistakes and to learn. That's what a game is. So how could you change the game to get a different result? And then comes the question, what would be the counterpart of those changes in real life? Because I'm a very practical person, I want my games to actually have a real impact. And so I go to this next one, which is not only you should identify what has to be changed, but you should develop a commitment that you're going to help make that change. Okay. This list is an excellent list. It's a comprehensive list. It's an important list. How each of those exists in connection with a particular game and a particular learning experience will differ very much. Sometimes I could spend three days going through these seven steps for one game. Other times, three minutes. Just depends. Remember, a game is a tool for learning. If I came to you and I said, I'm a carpenter, I want to make something out of wood, give me a tool, you would first ask, well, what do you want to build? I don't know if to give you a hammer or a saw or a drill. I mean, you can't know what tool you need until you know the purpose. Same thing with a game. You can't know what game to use and what debriefing process to use until you have a clear idea of the purpose. And not only the purpose, but 
who is participating, what do they bring in, what are their concerns, and so forth. Okay. So far, no one has asked any questions. So I know either that I'm doing a brilliant job of communicating, <laughs> which is certainly not true, or you're not listening, which is certainly not true, or what? What's the third option? You what? Maybe don't understand. Maybe don't understand. <laughs> then I told you, you have to raise your hand. Well, to we understand. started to do something. Yes. The questions will rise. OK, he says so. We'll see. Uh, one more uh, technical vocabulary, which is very important. When I was running this team building campus, a common problem that we had was uh, some company president or some mayor in a city or some uh, university president would send a group of people to the center and say, learn how to work together better as a team. The thing is, they weren't a team. They didn't want to be a team. They came because the boss told them to come. Very frustrating for them. Total waste of time for me. A group is a number of people who are together for some reasons. So for example, uh, running a marathon. A big group of people will come to, a, to New York every year to run the marathon. A team is a group of people who, have, who attach importance to the same goal. They understand the goal, and they think it's an important goal. They value the goal, and they understand they can't achieve that goal unless they work together. In a marathon, you don't work together. You try to beat everybody. You are happy when they fail. On a soccer team, you have to work together, typically. And you are not happy if one of your teammates is hurt. It makes it more difficult for you to achieve your own goal. By and large, uh, and let me say, and with teams, uh, or w there's two kinds of teams. An intact team comes in from an organization. They were a team back there, maybe developing new projects or trying to reduce the cost of the organization. Some, anyway, they were working together on something. They come here, they learn better how to be a team, and then they go back home and continue uh, to perform as a team. That's intact team. Ad hoc team is where a bunch of people come together from many different places. They never knew each other before, by and large. They come together, they work together for a while, and then they go back out. When you work with your students, it's sometimes intact team, sometimes ad hoc team. More likely, it's ad hoc uh, team <clears throat> in many cases. And the games you use and the way you use the games will depend on this. Because with an intact team, if you give them a word, of a, then when they go home, they can continue to use that word. With ad hoc team, if you give each person a new word and they go back home and use that word, nobody understands the meaning of the words. So the, you, your learning strategy, teaching strategy, has to be very different. It's fine, yes, it's fine that some groups are not teams. Uh, teams have a special purpose. Groups serve other purposes. So I'm not trying to make everybody be a team. But when I'm trying to do a learning process for people, I need to know if they are a team or a group, because it has a very big influence on the strategy. Question? And that would be my question. How do you distinguish if it's a group or a team? If nobody cares what the other ones are doing, just has their own goals, then it's maybe more clear that it's a group of people. If you have everybody is carrying, sharing the same goals, working together, then you have a team. But if you have some of the team or of the, let's say, amount of people that are forming a group or a team that caring for the common goal and working together and some not, 
Where is the distinguishment and where do you count it as a team and as a group? So uh, this, it's an important point. You can have a number of people, many of them actually are a team, but one or two people are not. Um, so it's hard to speak about these things in the abstract. You know, you really need to know is it sport team or business team or whatever. But, but your point is correct. It's not black and white. Uh, it can be partly sometimes one, sometimes other. And of course, when you have a number of people in the room, in some ways they are a team, in other ways they are not a team uh, at the same time. Okay, this is my last theoretical slide here. <clears throat> it's also useful to differentiate between literal and metaphorical games. Literal games use the vocabulary of the real system. I mean, if it's a fishing game, in the game you'll see ships and boats and captains and, and so forth. Uh, the cause and effect, the rules are like the rules in the real system to some extent, simplified. Uh, the numbers are ordinally correct. Ordinally means uh, bigger rather than smaller, not, not precise coefficients. So I have a fishing game. Uh, the price of the fish is not accurate in the real world, but it, it has a relationship to the value of the boats and so forth. Uh, in my game, fish are cheaper than boats. In the real life, fish are cheaper than boats. In real life, boats are thousands of times more expensive than fish. In my game, they're hundreds of times more expensive. Ordinarily, it's uh, the same. A metaphorical game doesn't obviously relate to any particular system. I'm going to illustrate in just a moment. So. Uh, it generates an outcome which can be related to many different issues. And uh, we like metaphorical games. If you're skilled at helping your students understand the relationship between what happened in the game and real life. So mostly we're talking about metaphorical games today. Yes? Is paper tear an example of a metaphorical game? Is what? Is paper tear? Paper tear, yes, thank you. Paper tear is an example of a metaphorical game. Uh, this phenomenon, uh, you know, it generates an outcome. The outcome is <clears throat> I say one thing, you do something different. That's an outcome which relates to climate change or uh, oil production or uh, agriculture. I mean, you can relate it to many different issues. And therefore, it's a very powerful game to have. If you had to learn one game for every different situation, you would spend all of your time mastering games. And if you can just have five or 10 metaphorical games, then you are incredibly powerful. You can go into many different situations and help people understand something by a simple game. Now I'm going to show you a metaphorical game, secret code. <coughs> I discovered in a book a secret code. I'm going to use that code to tell you different numbers. And to make it simple, I will tell you numbers just between 1 and 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, even integers, no decimals. Very simple. So five different possibilities. Initially, when I show you the code, you won't understand what number I'm showing you, but quickly you will understand the code, and then I can use that code to show you numbers. Okay? <clears throat> what number am I showing you? I'm showing you four. How many people thought I was showing you four? Raise your hand. About a fifth, which is, of course, what you would expect. Random. Try it again. Well, 
What number am I showing you? Don't say it out. I've formed a number in your mind, and then I'll, I'll ask. But if you shout out a number, see, it's an interesting principle of game. If, you, if one person shouts out the number, everybody else says, oh, I don't have to think about it. <laughs> and if they don't think about it, they don't make mistakes. And if they don't make mistakes, they don't learn. What number am I showing you? I'm showing you one. Who thought I was showing one? Oh, getting better. Try it again. What number am I showing you? I'm showing you three. Who thought I was showing you three? Oh, this is going backwards. <laughs> now I'm showing you five. <laughs> now I'm showing you one. What am I showing you now? Two. Great. The code is very simple, but you have to look outside the box. As soon as you don't permit me to bound where you look, you understand it very quickly. But if you let me restrict where you look with my box, you never figure it out. Sustainable development is like this. The politicians and the economists have made a box. And they tell us that inside that box, GNP and employment and stuff like that, those are the numbers we need to work with for sustainable development. Wrong. The answer to sustainable development is not inside that box. It's outside. OK. So you see, I, now I've used this exercise with people who are designing new agricultural technologies or trying to uh, reduce the costs uh, of the budget in the town. You can use it for all sorts of issues. Everyone has the problem that they're trying to solve some issue looking at the established data. And it's always the case that there will be elites, establishment, who are busy drawing a box and trying to keep you looking inside. Uh, we say in the United States, if I get to pick the candidates, I don't care who votes. As long as I can tell you what to look at, you can do anything you want to with it. But, but the real answer is out here. So this is a metaphorical game. Uh, that's a simple metaphorical game. I show you another simple metaphorical game. Hold out your hand and stick up your thumb. And put it over your head, and just now I'll tell you what to do. In a moment, I ask you to put it above your head and then make your thumb go clockwise in the direction of an analog clock. Okay? Now, here are the rules don't stop, don't change direction, slowly bring your hand down to the level of your belt and look at it. Okay? Okay, I'm waiting for everybody to follow the rules here. <laughs> when it's down there, see which direction it's going. How many are still going clockwise? Raise your hand. How many are going counterclockwise? Raise your hand. Half and half. Oh. What does this show? Well, it's like many things in real life. We have goals, in this case clockwise, and we have rules. In this case, don't stop, don't, etc. Sometimes the rules are opposite from what we need to achieve the goal. And then we have a choice. We can either give up our goal or change our rules. Half of you did one thing, and half of you did the other. Sustainable development is like that. The old rules won't give us sustainable development. But we have a lot of important, powerful people, organizations, laws, customs, norms, and ethics which produce the old behavior. If we continue to follow those rules, 
we are not going to get sustainable development. Circles in the air is a very simple way to open up a discussion about that. Now I tell you about a more complicated metaphorical game, just so you don't think all metaphorical games take only two minutes. <laughs> the, um, <clears throat> this is not my game. I didn't develop it, but uh, I use it often. And it's a very powerful game, and, and one which I think would be useful for you also. And when you get my slides, you'll see down here a website, which is a good description of the game. I think if you read that, you will be able to use the game yourself. The game is called Star Power. One thing about a metaphorical game is that it tends to have a title which doesn't relate to anything because you want to use it in many different circumstances. So Star Power has no special meaning. Here's how you do Star Power. I could do it with this group, but we don't have time. It's a little big. I maybe would. But I could do it with this group. Uh, now I'm going to pretend uh, like you are actually going to play this game. I'm just going to describe it to you to give you a sense about it. And remember, my goal is to show you a metaphorical game which can be used in many, many different circumstances, but it's rather more complex. Uh, star power takes uh, maybe 60 minutes or even 80 minutes to run. So I come into the room, have a group of equal friendly people, and I have a bag. And in the bag are many little different color chips, blue, red, green, and so forth. And I put up on the wall a poster which shows the point value of each chip. Yellow has a certain points, red certain points, and so forth. And in combinations, two reds are worth more than uh, one blue, and so forth. I go around. I ask each of you, without looking, to take five chips out of the bag. OK. And then to see the points by looking at the poster. And then on the board, I divide you into three groups, depending on the high points, middle, and low points. And of course, so far, totally random. If you are high, middle, or low, has absolutely nothing to do with how smart you are, rich you are, anything. It's just totally random. And then I label each of the groups with a little button. Stars, squares, triangles. And then I put you in different parts of the room. Stars, middle, etc. And then I describe a process we're going to negotiate each cycle, you will pull some chips out of the bag, and then you will go around and negotiate trades with other people. And after a certain period of time, we stop. I see the point count of your chips from the poster. We add it to your total. And then we redivide the group into high, medium, and low. So we do that. But I start to use three different bags. And the people who have the most points, they get to take their chips out of a bag which has more gold chips in it. And the people at the other end who have low points, they are taking their chips out of a bag that is only red chips, which are the lowest value. So what happens, the gap starts to open up. Then you introduce a voting scheme where you can change the rules, but you give more votes to the people in the top group. So they actually can veto uh, any change they don't like. And then you introduce procedures where the low group can push one of their people up into the high group, hoping that they will start to vote for rule changes. But it, what happens, of course, that low person getting up there immediately starts acting like a high value person. And then, you, and then it goes on. And pretty soon, the high value people are saying, well, we shouldn't even trade with those guys down there. They never have any gold chips. And the people at the bottom are saying, this is not a fair game. I'm going to quit because, I mean, what's the point? Uh, and then it's not fair that they can veto these, et cetera. And, and within about 60 minutes, people start to become very angry, very frustrated. Uh, and 
you can decide how you want to do it, but finally you stop the game and say, okay, now what is this about? It's about uh, the difference between blacks and whites in the United States. It's about the difference between uh, Catholics and Protestants, or members of the Communist Party and non-members of the Communist Party, or men and women, or whatever. Every society has ways to divide people and discriminate and to develop prejudices. Star power is a metaphorical experience which shows students that even though they think they are so smart and so fair and so liberal, in just a few minutes they can start to fall into stereotypic discriminatory behavior. So that's a complex metaphorical game. Okay. Uh, So let me now stop and ask if you have any questions. Yes? Uh, was it counterclockwise? I was thinking about it. And from my position, I was not looking upstairs. I was thinking, I'm standing above me. So then counterclockwise, it was so, like here. That is the reason for me. OK. Thank you. You know, it, the, the thing about, let me, as a teacher, let me tell you that it's frustrating to use games, because with lectures, you have total control. Mm -hmm. With games, you don't have total control. With a lecture, you can always give the same lecture. You never play this, the game the same way twice, because it always differs depending on the experiences, for example, yours, that are brought into the game. Okay, uh, So sometimes somebody will write me and say, I started to use one of your games and it was going in the wrong direction, so I forced it you know, to come out right. And I respond, uh, then you, this is, you're not using the games in the right way. The game has to unfold under its own logic and there need to be lessons no matter how it comes out. You know, in fish banks, typically people catch too many fish, sometimes not. If they don't, you shouldn't try to force them to, to catch too many fish. You should rather use this as an opportunity to explain what was special about this group which prevented that they overfished their resources. Okay. Other questions? What about a relationship between games and creation of new knowledge? Um, I think well, I explained this decision-making game where the company actually developed new ideas about where to put their laboratory. Typically, the games I use aren't generating new knowledge. They're transferring knowledge. Mm -hmm. Educational games are built where you know what are the important ideas that need to be conveyed and then you create the experience that conveys them. I, um, <clears throat> I built a game about national development stratagem. Uh, I was working at that time in Vienna at the United Nations and the way I started the game was I created a group of advisors, people who had actually been out in individual countries advising uh, senior officials about what to do, typically in Africa. I wanted people who had practical experience. And then I said to them, sitting around the table, what are the 10 or 15 most important ideas somebody should have f to have successful development? And then they, we finally agreed on a list. And then I built the game so that in order to win the game, you had to know those ideas. See, there was no, the game itself didn't create any new knowledge. It was a way of transferring the knowledge. Um, hopefully, the student who plays the game will gain new knowledge. I mean, if they didn't understand something before and now they play the game and understand it, they're getting new knowledge. But you as the operator aren't using the game to create new knowledge for yourself. Thanks. Other questions or comments? Uh, so, uh, just one comment on your slide where you had seven steps, steps. for the debriefing. Something that came to me a bit later, or after you'd gone to the next slide, which maybe others didn't pick up on either, was that was a sequence, and there were two pairs for each yeah. question, and that wasn't really clear in the slide. But now that I see it, it is, yeah. and maybe the language that you talked about so, earlier, it's part of people's 
let, let me just illustrate what he's talking about here. Uh, what he observed is that there are three pairs. One and two, three and four, five and six. The first of each pair looks at the game, and the second of each pair looks at real life. Then back at the game, then at real life. Then at the game, <coughs> then at real life. What happened in the game? Does that happen in real life? What caused that in the game? Does that, what causes, do those causes exist in real life? How could you change the game? How could you change real life? So you're using the game as an experiment, as a value-free opportunity to think about change. You see, if you immediately start talking about changing the real system, people get very emotional. They, they have a vested interest sometimes in the real system, or they have established ideas about the real system. And it's better, I find, uh, to talk about the game first and then go over to the real life. It makes a, a more logical process. So that's an important point. Any other comments or questions? I haven't found several times these, these games. I know it's such a thing that in one moment, the students realizing that they are not playing against another team, but playing the game playing against you who are setting the game. <laughs> yeah. They so, try to guess your rules or your behavior. Or yeah. um, so the question is, you know, do you get, get into a situation where the students quit playing the game and start somehow trying to play against you? As uh, It happens. It shouldn't happen. Uh, you should be like the conductor of an orchestra. You know, you don't play music, but you create the opportunity for the music, and you help the people to play together. You know, it wouldn't work with an orchestra to say, well, play whatever music you want and start whenever you like. You know, you, you pick the music, and then you give some rate. It should be like that. Uh, you have, as the operator, you have great influence over this. If you see this starting to happen, you should stop and try to understand why it's happening. Why are they now starting to pay attention to you instead of to the game? And get them back uh, into the process. Uh, it, you know, it, uh, you can't, you must not ignore the fact that you have a relationship with, especially if they are your students, if they are going to get grades from you. Uh, you, you know, there is, there is, uh, they are not free simply to play this game uh, in you know, without you. So you need to be aware of that and try to make it uh, unimportant. Some games are highly competitive. I mean, to win and lose is really important. Other games are cooperative, where actually not. I'll show you later uh, a game about that. So uh, it depends from one game to another. But at least you need to be very aware of your relationship to the participants, and to try create a situation where they are free to play out the game and, and learn from it. Um, safety is a key issue. When you create a, see, when you lecture, each person is free to participate or not. I mean, they sit there, and, but they can be thinking about something totally different. When you put people into a game experience, they're not free to not participate. Uh, the other people will expect them to do something. So you have to, so this gives you some responsibilities. If, the, if playing the game could uh, be dangerous, they could hurt themselves, either physically or psychologically, you need to be careful about that. You know, I, especially since many games have value because people make mistakes. I mean, learning comes from mistakes. Uh, you know, notice when I did paper tear, I didn't look at you and say, oh, you stupid people, why don't you ever <laughs> listen to me? You, I don't, you're worthless. No, I said, you're smart people, you are trying to do your best. The reason is not you, but the cause. You have to, you have to be aware of that. Yeah. come up with a new game? And what is the motivation? Has it, I mean, you're yeah. talking about mistakes. How okay, you... this, so it's an important question. How do you come up with a new game? 
Um, I'll just say a few things about that. I mean, uh, creating a game is an art. There are some scientific aspects to it, but it, basically it's an art. So I mean, uh, Rembrandt couldn't tell you how to make a painting like he does. Uh, he certainly couldn't tell me how to make a painting like he does. Uh, so, so there is no simple set of rules that bring you uh, to a game. But there are some principles. First of all, try to find, so first of all, be very, very clear. What are you trying to achieve? Games are tools. If you don't know what you're trying to achieve with the game, you, you have no basis for, for knowing what to do. You know, many people start off to make a game about something, and then I'll say, well, fine, but what are you going to use it for? And the answer is, oh, I don't know. I just, you know, I just want to make a game about this thing. I, uh, I had this conversation uh, with a Japanese colleague who uh, uh, Isak knows also, Rich. He's uh, working in a software company, and uh, one of the problems is that they make a lot of mistakes, and then they have to spend all their time fixing the mistakes, instead of, et cetera. So he said, I want to make a game about this. I said, fine, but what are we going to do with the game? And he didn't know exactly. Well, when you don't know exactly, you have no way to make the game. So first, be clear. Secondly, look around for some game already existing that you can experiment with. There are thousands of games. Uh, uh, there are uh, journals of games. There are professional societies of gamers. There are, so there are lots and lots of games. So look for one that works already and use it. It's always easier to modify something that works than to start from nothing. And then you have to go through the list. What are the, going to be the materials, the scenario, the roles, the rules, etc. So I mean, there's a, there's a cookbook. Uh, game design is, there are books about game design. Uh, but generally speaking, it, this is not a topic which is very useful in the abstract. You need a specific purpose, a specific system, a specific teaching goal, a specific group of students, and then you can come up with something. I would tell you, as a, initially, don't waste your time trying to develop new games. <laughs> don't. It's hard, it takes a lot of time, and often it doesn't work. Many of my games never work. I have, on my desk are several games I've been working on for years, really, literally years, and they still don't work. So. How, how often do you bring all the way down to committing? Yeah, OK. Um, so what uh, Lars is asking is, how well does this work? Well, you know, it's hard to change things. So typically, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, there are specific techniques for doing this. Uh, I, I'll illustrate one. It's, it's in itself a kind of a game. It's called Letter to Myself. Uh, after I do a workshop, I give every participant a piece of paper and an envelope. And I say, write a letter to yourself, which I will send you in three months. And it says, you know, dear self, here are the most, here's the most important idea I got out of this workshop. And here's what I'm going to do about it over the next three months. And then put the letter into the envelope, seal it. I don't look at it. But in three months, I send it to you. And then you're going to have to read what you thought you were going to do and, and see if you did it. Of course, most people don't do anything. But some people are motivated to try to do something more. There are other techniques for that. Uh, an issue I'll, or a, a definition I'll give you later, which I, I mentioned on the boat, is this distinction between universal problems and global problems. I'll, talk in more detail later. Universal problems are ones where people actually can change things. Uh, you know, reducing air pollution in Uppsala is hard, but it's something which you could imagine how to do it. Uh, global problems like uh, climate change and nuclear proliferation, it's almost impossible for one person to imagine what they could do. And so 
you could have some success here with universal problems and not much success with global problems, typically. OK, we, uh, we're going to break soon. Uh, Yes, one comment. Uh, you know Alan Atkinson's pyramid? Yes. Many of us here have been doing it, and some have actually also been conducting it. How does it relate to the games? I mean that exercise of his? Uh, yeah, the, pyra the pyramid building. Is it a game? Or is it something well, else? Well, so the pyramid building is a game. It's a structured role-playing exercise. It has most of the components of the game, rules and materials and so forth. Uh, with a the pyramid is a metaphorical game, and so therefore the value depends on how skillful you are in drawing out the lessons. With a literal game, sometimes you can learn the lesson just by playing the game, and the things which make you successful in the game would be useful in real life. With a metaphorical game, the things which produce success in the game you know, aren't something you could do anywhere. You have to think what is the counterpart of that. Uh, and so that requires uh, skilled debriefing. Yes? Uh, you said your games, somebody didn't work. Mm -hmm. It sounds very motivating for us, very encouraging. Why? Why your, they didn't work? Why is your games didn't work? And the main uh, practical problems of debriefing this cycle. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, theoretically, I understand those. Um, connection between games and life, but in practice, I suppose, there are more, much more problems. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean... Thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you asked two questions. Really, one is why the games didn't work, yes. and then the second question, aren't there more problems, uh, isn't it more life real, more complicated than this? Um, my games, when I think about failure, mm -hmm. uh, failure is different. So I, what I said was I, I often fail to create a new game. Uh, it means just that I'm not able finally to get a, a, a package which worked with a group to give them new insights. That's very difficult. Um, um, so, uh, but, that's, but that needn't be demotivating for you because you don't want to develop new games anyway. You want to use existing games. Sometimes using existing games fails. Why? Well, uh, if the purpose of, of course, what is failure? Failure is that you don't get what you want. There's two ways to avoid failure. Get more or want less. Uh, so I, tr I don't imagine I'm going to run a game that will cause people to make a commitment individually to changing global problems. So I restrict to universal problems. So that's one way to avoid that kind of failure. Sometimes I'm working with a group, and they are not actually a team. They are a group. Uh, I, I mentioned my national development game. Uh, recently, I played it in Hamburg for a group of bankers. And they weren't interested in developing the country. Each of them was interested in getting the highest number of points. And the way you get the highest number of points is actually to drive the country into the ground. I mean, uh, in the last round, it has no resources, no education, no infrastructure. None but you have a lot of points. Well, they were success. I was not successful. So I mean, failure comes in many different ways. But, uh, but of course, lectures fail all the time. You know, to say the games are not perfect is not to say you shouldn't use them. It only means you have to be careful. Life is complicated. The value of a game is that it simplifies things and lets you focus on, on a few central points. It's like you're doing in your teaching. You know, you're talking. I mean, my goodness, sustainable development is an incredibly complex issue. If you lecture about sustainable development, you are focusing on some key ideas, I guess. That's what the game does. OK, so now we're going to break uh, until 10 to 11. It's much easier to change 
the introduction and the debriefing of the game in order to pull out the lessons that you want rather than trying to change the game itself. Uh, now I'm going to spend, I hope, about only 15, 20 minutes illustrating two very different ways to teach the same lessons, showing you that you don't necessarily need to be more and more complicated in order to, to get all the lessons. Uh, let me first ask, how many of you have ever played the game Fish Banks? How many of you have used it in your teaching? Okay, uh, about half. Fish Banks uh, is a game I developed back in uh, the 80s, 1980s, to make some points about sustainable use of renewable resources. Uh, resources are of two sorts, of course, renewable, which regenerate uh, soil fertility, fish, forests, uh, water, and so forth are renewable resources, and then non-renewable resources, which don't regenerate, oil, copper, gold, uh, and so forth. <coughs> and the dynamics of sustainable use are very different, depending on whether it's a renewable or non-renewable resource. With a renewable resource, there is the concept of sustainable yield. How much can you use every year and still leave the resource basically uh, productive and intact? And the concept maximum sustainable yield. What's the most that you can use? With non-renewable resources, there is no sustainable yield. Every time you use it, there's less, less left. Uh, you can Imagine to find substitutes, maybe in the future, but finally you're going to take it down. So two dynamically very different issues, and I was trying to illustrate something about renewable resources. And I picked fisheries uh, as an example, uh, because uh, ocean fisheries uh, tend to be simpler than inland fisheries or forestry or other things where national laws and national customs and national technology can differ very much. By and large, in the open seas, the technology and the rules and so forth are quite similar for everybody. Uh, so I created this game, and, uh, which I'm going to show you, and then it was, it's now used uh, by thousands of different places around the world in about 15 languages. Uh, but the point about fish banks is that you can accomplish the central purpose much simpler. So I'm now going to ex explain fish banks. For those of you who've used it, it will be a, just to remind you about it. And for those who never saw it before, you won't fully understand the game, but you get some idea about it. And then I'm going to show you the alternative. So first of all, let me uh, just remind you about the difference this is a slide I used before, literal versus uh, metaphorical game. And I'm going to show you a literal and a metaphorical fish banks. There are two kinds of games. Participation game is what fish banks is. In fish banks, typically, uh, you have a group of about 30 people. They constitute uh, five or six teams and they go fishing, so uh, everybody participates in the process. Uh, with a mass game, one person stands up front and then everybody can do something uh, at the same time. The difference is with participation games, the numbers are quite limited, 30, 40, 50, something like that. With mass games, you can do 1,000 or 2,000 people at the same time. And remember the parts of the game, you'll see that for a simple metaphorical game, of course, all of these parts exist, but they're much simpler than uh, for the literal game. Okay, so uh, I'm going to quickly introduce fish banks, but we're not going to play it. I'm just, just to give you a sense about a literal game. Uh, these are the slides which I use to introduce the game. I tell people I'm going to sign the roles, etc. So these are the different uh, things in the game. These are the roles in the, in the literal fish banks game. There's a ship handler who 
carries around ships and trades. There's a record keeper who is entering data onto a sheet, a negotiator who's going around to try to bargain on prices, strategist trying to figure out how many boats to send out to which place and so forth. The criterion of success in the game is that each team is trying to get the maximum possible assets by the end of the game. And assets is equal to the bank balance, which is a number kept by the computer, and the salvage value of their boats. For those of you who are using a really old version of fish banks, you should know there's a new version where the salvage value depends on how much you caught in the last year. So when you overfish, finally the value of your boats goes down to zero. It makes people more concerned about overfishing. Uh, I define the indicator of success, profit, which is the difference between income and expenses. And then I define the individual components. And I give an example just to show how the mechanics are going to work inside the computer program. Uh, if you send one ship to the deep sea, it catches 25 fish for 20 bucks, et cetera. So I just, just helping them to understand what the, what the numbers mean. And I also show them the computer model, how it does the calculations. When you play a game, it's important that the players accept personal responsibility for the results. If they think that the results of the game came from some unknown random process or from a mistake in the computer program or from something that you imposed on the regroup, then they don't take responsibility for the results and they can't learn from their mistakes. They just blame it on you and they don't think about it. So it's very important for people to understand everything about the mechanics of the game. There shouldn't be something random or unknown. In fish banks, there's one very small random component, which is the weather, that influences the amount of catch. And I put that in there. It doesn't make a difference between winning and losing, but it makes it a little more difficult to figure out the relationship between the number of ships and the ship and the fish density, so, which is like real life. But generally speaking, people should, you know, I'm, I'm always very concerned. If I, it often happens when, when the results are different from what people expect, they come to me and say, there's a mistake in your game. There's a mistake in your computer program. And I need to go back and show them how the results absolutely came from what they did, from those rules, and from those numbers which they knew. Because if they think it's a mistake, then, then it's not their problem. It's very crucial. Yeah. I was just thinking about that also when you were talking about the previous uh, games and, and things. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with a scenario where participants in the game begin appealing to you as some sort of arbiter and trying to game the results in their own favor by arguing instead of accepting the rules as they are? So this... So the, the question kind of generally is, what should you do if the participants try to bring you in to the game in a way that will influence the result maybe in their favor? Uh, it's hard to answer a question like that in abstract. You really need to look at the specific uh, circumstances. But we can say it's important that you shouldn't get into the game. Uh, I would say if that happens a lot, then either it's a bad game or you're a bad operator. I mean, uh, somehow there's a mistake there. It shouldn't happen that way. Uh, the, you should be able to present the game in a way that people will take seriously and they accept the rules. Uh, during the break, uh, just coffee break, someone came up to me and, and said, asked essentially something like this question. How, how can I get people to take these games seriously? I want to run a game, but they, they don't play. They won't, they won't play. Uh, and I said to that person, uh, I said four things. First of all, it's inherently difficult for her to get people to take the game seriously because she's short, young, and female. 
I mean, it's not fair, but that's the way it is. If she were big and old and male, exactly the same group and exactly the same games would be fine, typically. That's one thing I said. And then I said, three times I've uh, had problems getting people under three different circumstances. I've had trouble getting people to take the game seriously. When I was young, I used to teach uh, at uh, corporate presidents. In a, they would come together for a week, and I would uh, show them some games. And I, I felt they weren't taking the game seriously. And so, but I was young. So I started to dress with a coat and tie, and I shaved off my beard. Uh, and that made a difference. That's the first thing to do. The second thing is to, to be careful about your terminology. Uh, see, if you're working with students, they have to play your game, but they don't have to take it seriously. You know, they can go through the motions and just think it's fun, but not, not interesting. So watch your terminology. In Germany, when I'm using games with corporate groups, I don't use the term spiel, because that is, although it's a literal translation of game, uh, it's a term which is not taken seriously. So with German executives, I talk about strategic planning exercises. <laughs> do you want to do a strategic planning exercise or not? Oh, sure. Why not? In the United States, not a problem, because their strategic gaming has a long culture. We have military games and business games and so forth. So there, it's, it's, it's not an issue. And the third thing, which is also important for you, even with your students, Take the game seriously. Don't take up the time of your students with a game which is not going to be useful to them. And make sure you master the game so that you don't, you know, the worst thing is you get up and you start to talk about the rules. You say, oh, no, whoops, I forgot something. That's not like that. It's like this. And then pretty soon they just, you know, they're not interested anymore because if you even don't, understand the rules of the game, why they should understand the rules of the game. And plus, which they're going to start blaming their mistakes on you. So you need to take the game seriously. Treat it seriously. Uh, one other thing I said, be careful. Uh, I, again, I, I mentioned to somebody else uh, this Japanese saying, if your only tool is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you're only, you only have one game, then you pretty soon it seems like everybody in the world needs to play that game in order to learn whatever they want to learn. And of course, most games are not useful for most groups under most circumstances. So you need, as a teacher, to master a variety of games so that you have the one which is useful for a particular circumstance. Okay. So uh, in this game, there's quite a bit of material. So I have uh, fishing boats, uh, red ones and white ones and yellow ones. Uh, and oceans and role descriptions. One if you have a complicated game, you better be sure that most people aren't going to bother to read stuff ahead of time. So although I always give out the rules ahead of time, I always assume that they didn't read it. And so I do it again uh, before the game. OK. And uh, you know, all the indicators of success and, and numbers and so forth. And, uh, and then the rules, how to order new ships, how, what is influencing the catch of the of the fish, what determines the relationship between fish density and so forth. Uh, and then the coefficients, how the fish are regenerating, crucial slide because we're talking about a renewable resource. In the coastal area, fewer fish than, and this is depending on density. Here again, the, this doesn't correspond to any particular fish, but it's ordinarily correct. Okay, good question. 
Uh, thank you. So her question is, what is, how are these interrelated? The board, ships, computer program, sheet. My philosophy is that I don't like computer games and computer models. I'm trying to teach people about real world problems. And I believe that most real world problems come because of difficulties between people. So in my games, I want the people to stay in contact with each other. But on a complicated system, uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time calculating, so I put that into the computer. But in fish banks, the participants never come in contact with the computer model. One assistant sits in the corner, takes the data from these sheets, enters it into the computer, prints out the results, and brings the paper back to the people and they fill it in. So the people are only working with these sheets. Um, some of you were present when I ran a bunch of workshops in the Soviet Union uh, a long time ago. Uh, and I ran fish banks, actually. Uh, I, I went to 10 different cities and I ran uh, workshops. Uh, and in that workshop, uh, in each case, I used fish banks. And what I noticed there uh, that if I gave the group direct access to the computer, then typically the dominant male would sit down and be the one that operates the computer, and the subordinate males would stand behind and comment. And the women, who actually in most cases were smarter, <laughs> would stand back you know, and watch. Because the computer and access to the computer distorts the social network in a way which doesn't happen in real life, typically. Sometimes, but typically not. So I didn't, so the game that was being played uh, was different from the system I was trying to teach about. So I took the computer away. I didn't give people access to the computer. And then they all had to sit down and talk. Uh, incidentally, when, uh, as a, a, a strategy of game operation, when decisions have to be made, I like to have three, four, five people together deciding what they want to do. If only one person decides, they don't have to defend or explain their decisions. They just do it. And if you have 10 or 15 people involved in a decision, that's too many. It means one or two or three people will do it, and the others basically are passive. So I like a group of three, four, five, something like that. So that if somebody makes a decision, they have to defend it and explain it to the other people. And then I encourage you know, dis argument and dispute inside the group so that really people do agree on something and don't just let one person do it. And then here's the history. This is the scenario. I'm showing what's been going on in the past, past time and the catch and number of ships. Notice I don't put any numbers there so that, uh, because I don't want to tell them what to do, but simply that things are going up. And then I explain the materials, the ships. I made three different kinds of ships because in the course of the game, you start with 24 ships and you can go up to a couple hundred. And if you only had one kind of ship, it would be just cumbersome. So I let a gold ship equal 10. Therefore, it's much easier just to have a few ships on there. But they represent many ships. That's a decision sheet. In this case, you go through 10 cycles. And each year, there's a set of steps. And then you advance one year, et cetera. Uh, steps of play. And then trying to get them into developing a strategy, starting to think about the nature of renewable resources and so forth, et cetera. OK, it's a complicated game. It takes about uh, six, uh, it takes me about 10 or 12 minutes to introduce it. 
And then I give to each person the rules, which are exactly what I just said in, in the 12 minutes. Uh, and I hope that at least one person in each team actually read the rules so that they can explain it to, uh, to the other people. It takes about 60 minutes to play. Uh, and then it takes, should take 30 or 60 minutes to debrief. You can do this in one piece, uh, or you can uh, do it over a semester. Uh, you can ha have them do one cycle each semester. You can debrief verbally, or you can ask people to do writing assignments uh, for you. So many, many different ways. That's the literal participation game. Now I'm going to show you a very different way to do the same thing. And my goal is just to show that uh, things don't need to be always so complicated. What is the initial or the, the principal idea of fish banks? The principal idea of fish banks is that a renewable resource regenerates each year. And that if you're trying to take the maximum of that resource out over a long period of time, you must not go above the maximum regeneration rate. You can't, every year, take out more fish than are coming in. It's like a bathtub over, or a bank account. Over a short period of time, you can take out more than is going in, but eventually it comes down to zero. Same thing with any renewable resource. So it's the basic idea is that there's some regeneration versus population. This is zero population. Obviously, if there's zero population, there's no regeneration. If you don't have any fish, you're not going to have any little fish. And this is the maximum sustainable. For any population on any resource base, there is a maximum which can be sustained over the long time. And when the population is at the maximum, the net regeneration is also zero. This is net. It means births minus deaths. And this is the maximum regeneration, and that's also the maximum sustainable yield. And if you harvest less than that, the system can continue forever. And if you harvest more than that, you collapse the resource. That's the basic idea. It applies for any renewable resource, of course. But it's very clear with ocean fisheries. So I've described a complicated game for talking about that. Now I'm going to show you a very simple game. <laughs> 